The next thing we're going to talk about is energy. The definition for energy is the ability to produce a change in itself or in its surroundings. And there are two types of energy. You've probably heard of both of these. Potential energy is considered to be stored energy. And then whenever an object is moving, it has kinetic energy. We are going to discuss these in a bit more detail, but for today, we're gonna to concentrate just on potential energy. There are six types of potential energy. And when we look at our equations, you will either see potential energy represented by PE or by the letter U. So I may use both of those, recognize them both as the variable for potential energy. For the first type, gravitational potential energy, this is the one that will be most common for us. And anytime you do work against gravity, then you have now given that object gravitational potential energy. Since you've done work against gravity, we're going to use that idea of work to come up with our equation for gravitational potential energy. So remember that work is force times displacement. Whenever we do work against gravity to lift an object, the force we are applying would be equal to that object's weight, and then our displacement specifically will be in the vertical direction. Remember, we can find weight by multiplying mass times gravity, and then vertical displacement's kind of a mouthful, so we will refer to that as height. So this is the work done to lift, and I picked a book as our object and put it on the table. That work we did against gravity is now stored in the object as potential energy, and we have the ability to get all of it back. What that means in this case is that the object can fall down and gravity can return that object to its original position. So when we look at the work we've done against gravity and how that's stored as potential energy, we would simply multiply mass times gravity times the height and the units for potential energy, since it came from work, it's also gonna be in joules. Now it's really important that you specify a reference point, and we're gonna talk about some of these examples in class on how the potential energy of an object would change based on the reference point, but this is something that's going to be really important for us. So remember, we are going to specify a reference point. So remember in class, visually, we're gonna have some examples, but I also picked an example problem so that we can talk about this reference point. Sometimes it's helpful to draw a picture of the scenario, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So we're told that we have a 1.6 kilogram book, so we know its mass. It's held 60 centimeters above a desk, so let's move that up. And then the desktop is 90 centimeters above the floor. When I label my picture, I'm gonna go ahead and convert centimeters to meters for both of those. So now we have the ground, the top of the desk, 90 centimeters above the floor, and then the book, another 60 centimeters above the desk. We are asked to find the potential energy. So we know that we are gonna multiply mass times gravity times height, but we want it with respect to the desk and with respect to the floor. With respect to the desk, that means our desk is going to be the reference point, and our book is only 0.6 meters above that point. So let's plug in those numbers. You should get a potential energy of approximately 9.4 joules. Now let's erase and do the second part of the problem, which is with respect to the floor. With respect to the floor, that means we are now going to look at this total vertical displacement, or height, from the floor all the way up to where the book is. So with respect to the floor means that we're gonna have a total height of 1.5 meters. So use your formula, plug in the numbers, and see if you get the same answer I do. You should get an answer of 23.5 joules. So remember, a reference point is very important so in your problem, you would pay attention to the reference point being with respect to the desk or respect to the floor or some other object. We might actually have an example problem where we're looking for potential energy with respect to the ceiling. So pay attention to the reference point and we'll do some more examples in class. The next type of 
potential energy that we'll talk about in detail is elastic potential energy. So remember, elastic substances are one of the things that you can do work against. And anytime you do work against something that can stretch or compress, then you have given it elastic potential energy. But before we get into the actual potential energy part, we need to look at a new concept called Hooke's Law. The actual law states that the force exerted by a spring is directly proportional to the amount that the spring is stretched. So the harder you pull on a spring, the more it's going to stretch. This force that's going to pull the spring back and restore it to its original or equilibrium position is called the restoring force. So that's a new vocabulary word as well. So you apply a force to stretch the spring, and then the restoring force puts it back to where it was. And the measure of an elasticity or stiffness of a particular spring is called the spring constant. It's denoted by the variable, this is a lowercase k, and it has units of newtons over meters. If a particular spring has a higher k value or spring constant, that means that it's more stiff and it's difficult to make that stretch. And if it has a lower spring constant or a low k value, that's a more flexible string and it's easier to stretch. The formula for Hooke's law is F equals a negative kx. For us, we are going to deal with just the magnitude of this force. So we will ignore this negative sign. It's okay if you want to change that to just F equals kx. If you were ever asked for a direction of a force, you can simply draw a picture or write out a direction. You're welcome to use a plus and minus sign. I'm gonna show you an example of that. Let's say I were to apply a force and stretch the spring out. My force would be applied in this direction, so it stretches that spring. However, remember the restoring force is the one that makes it return back to that position, and the restoring force would be the one that pulls it back to its original shape. So that's where that negative sign comes from. But again, for us, we're only gonna be interested in the magnitude, so it's okay if you ignore that negative sign for our purposes. So let's try an example problem. We have a force of six newtons that compresses a spring by 4.5 centimeters, and you are asked to find the spring constant. So our variables, we are told that there's a force of six newtons. The spring is compressed. The x is referring to that distance that a spring stretches or compresses. So we do want to change that four and a half centimeters to meters. So we're going to divide by a hundred. And we are asked to find the k value. Now again, remember we're going to ignore that negative sign because we're only interested in the magnitude of our quantities. So we'll plug in six newtons and that's equal to the k, and then our x value was 0.045 meters. So now we can simply divide and solve for k. You should get about 133 newtons over meters. Now that we are a little bit familiar with a spring constant, we can use that in our elastic potential energy. So the potential energy for a spring is found by multiplying 1 half times k, that spring constant value, times x squared. Remember, k tells you the elasticity, how easily or difficult a spring can stretch, and x tells you the amount that spring stretches or compresses. So in our above problem, we're gonna find the elastic potential energy of that spring. Remember that we found a spring constant of 133 newtons over meters and the distance that the spring got compressed was 0.045 meters. So all we have to do is plug those in. So try that out and see if you get the right answer. You should have gotten a small value for the elastic potential energy of about 0.135 joules. Now in the next example problem, I'm gonna set it up for you and you plug in and see what you get. We are told that the spring stretches 25 millimeters Remember, you want to change that to meters. And then we're also given a force of 0.42 newtons. And you're asked to find the potential energy. You want to take the same steps that we did before. 
you're going to need to find k first, and you would do that by using Hooke's Law. Then, once you know the k value, you can use that to find the potential energy. So pause the video, try it out on your own, and then come back and check your answers. Okay, so when you work this out, you should have gotten a spring constant value of 16.8. Notice how that's a lot lower value than the previous example problem, so the spring is really, really easy to stretch. And then that would give us a potential energy value of 5.25 times 10 to the negative third joules. The last part of elastic potential energy we're going to discuss is going to be graphing. Now on your test, I'm going to give you this type of graph. It'll be force versus displacement, which is referring to how far a spring stretches or compresses. And it'll have a shape similar to this, some sort of positive sloped straight line. Let's write down our two equations. For Hooke's Law, I'm just going to look at the absolute value of that so I don't have to worry about any sort of negative signs and say that force is the spring constant times that displacement, and then PE is my one-half kx squared. So if we were to look at the slope of this graph, everyone should know that slope is rise over run, and in this case, the rise would be my force, and the run would be the x value. Now, out of my equations, Hooke's Law has force and x in it, and if I were to rearrange that one, I would be left with k. So if I were to give you this type of graph and ask you what quantity is determined by the slope, the answer would be the spring constant. Or I could also give you the graph and ask you to find the spring constant, and you would do that by simply calculating the slope of that line. As for the area, we've discussed area before, so I would go out to the end of my line and drop a line straight down and look at this shaded section, and that makes a triangle. The area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. So in this case, the base of my triangle would be x and the height would be the force. Now I'm gonna make a substitution. From Hooke's Law, I'm going to still keep my 1 half x, but instead of saying the force right here, I'm going to say kx instead. So look what happens when we multiply half of x times kx. This ends up giving us an area of 1 half kx squared. Look, that's the same thing as the potential energy. So if you're asked what quantity is determined by the area of this type of graph, that would simply be potential energy. Or I could give you a graph and ask you to find potential energy, and you would do that by taking the area. For the remaining types of potential energy, we might discuss these later in the year at a later chapter. But for right now, you only need to be able to list them. And then I did give you some examples to help you recognize them, but on a test, you just need to be able to name the other types of potential energy. They are magnetic, electric, chemical, and nuclear. So take a moment if you wanted to write down any of those examples, you're welcome to do that. That's it for this section. Next time we will pick up with talking about kinetic energy.